This is Electrifying Mojo Power 96 with Bishop Desmond Tutu. Bishop Tutu, it is an extreme pleasure to talk to you and also to uh, have you in the Metro Detroit area. Um, last night we um, did a segment of the show and I dedicated it to you. And I started it off by saying, uh, whenever man's inhumanity against man uh, reaches epidemic proportions, a prophet arrives on the scene to try to calm the troubled waters and try to help people see the light who don't see the light. Uh, do you see yourself as the prophet of this generation? First of all, may I say thank you uh, for your very kind welcome and also for your uh, dedication of uh, a part of your program um, uh, to me. I don't, I don't think any one of us usually sits looking at yourself in a mirror and say, hey, aren't I wonderful? Here I am, I'm a prophet, or, or whatever it may be that uh, we are called to be. You just try to respond to God's call. I mean, you have your particular calling as a communicator, um, and you don't go preening yourself um, all over the place. You just want to try and carry out what you're doing. And it is usually for other people uh, to try to say what the, their assessment is of you. Uh, Bishop Tutu, let's, let's project ourselves into the future. Let's just pick a year, um, 1995. The year is 1995. Uh, the evil system of apartheid has been abandoned. There is now a new large segment of new voters in South Africa. Uh, the government has been reorganized. Uh, free elections for the first time have been planned. At that time, you'll still be a, a young age of 63. Um, when you look back on the year 1986, the year that you visited America, you made millions of brand new friends. And there's uh, a tremendous international support for uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu to become the first president of a free South Africa. How would you respond to that challenge? Oh, I, I have no doubt at all that um, I would say, not on your life, uh, there are far, far more worthy people, and our people know whom they want. Uh, they want Nelson Mandela, um, and pray God that he will be alive, hale and hearty to take on this. I have no political ambition whatsoever. I, I am a simple pastor and would like to be able uh, to be allowed to uh, do the thing that God has asked me to do, which is to be a pastor to his people. Uh, speaking of uh, Mr. Mandela, uh, what are the differences and the similarities between the philosophies of uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu and Mr. Mandela? Hardly any significant difference. Uh, we all, including myself and uh, Nelson, want a country in South Africa where a person is valued because they are a person and not because of a biological irrelevance, the color of their skin. Uh, we are looking for a society which will be compassionate and caring, a society where black and white would be able to live amicably together, a society that is democratic uh, with a freely elected uh, government chosen by all of the people participating in the elections. Um, we we would be looking for uh, the kind of country that would be compassionate, uh, it would be sharing, it would be caring. And, and that has been the objective of 
the organization which uh, Nelson Mandela heads, the African National Congress. Where we would part company is um, how to achieve that goal. And his organization has been compelled by the intransigence of the South African government and by having been declared an illegal organization in 1960, um, uh, they have been compelled to opt for the armed struggle. Now, I could not, at this present stage, support that side of um, uh, his uh, method. What, what if a situation were to develop? Well, let me ask the question this way. They see there's a time bomb that's ticking in South Africa. And each day, each year, each moment, it ticks louder and louder and louder. And when there's a time bomb, uh, it inevitably leads to an explosion. Do you think this time bomb can be diffused um, with uh, the position that you take? Um. I believe that uh, your description is quite right. It is frightening that um, we are on the verge of a catastrophe at home when uh, we could have um, an enormous uh, conflagration. But that it is still possible um, if the South African government can be pressured uh, to go to the negotiating table with the authentic uh, and true representatives and, and spokespersons for the various sections of our community, uh, it is possible to negotiate a, a settlement in which we would have a transition from a repressive uh, dispensation to a more um, equitable one. But if the international community does not assist us, especially if um, America does not assist us, uh, then it is likely that the time bomb will explode. So, so you're saying basically that while it's true it's up to uh, South Africans to solve this South African problem, that it's possible that with pressure from America and other large co countries in the uh, European bloc, that uh, the bomb could be diffused from the outside. Oh yes, I believe this quite fervently. Um, and I think the United States does know that it has a pivotal role uh, to play in determining whether we are going to have a reasonably peaceful resolution of the crisis of our country uh, or the opposite, uh, what a former prime minister in South Africa called the alternative too ghastly to contemplate. Um, and <clears throat> we have been trying to say the kind of pressures we want are political, diplomatic, but above all economic. Uh, and the people of this country, the great people of this country have through making a moral choice against apartheid forced the hand of the of the president because he has uh, been compelled to apply uh, sanctions against South Africa against his will. What companies can you name do you see as uh, uh, the main culprits that are a, a part of the problem as opposed to being a part of the solution? Uh, and these American companies are companies that people would recognize right off. Um, maybe uh, uh, there's a possibility that, you know, these companies can be dealt with or can be uh, 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 convinced that it's in the best interest of the survival of their country, you know, for this to end peacefully. Yes, I... Why don't we be nice for the moment and, and say that um, there are several American corporations in, in, in South Africa. 
um, and people know them. I mean, you know, and I would, I would, I would say that maybe I should not name them uh, at this point uh, because they are very, very well known, especially some which are based in your city. <laughs> I think a lot of people would like to know. I, w I would like to know. Um, without uh, uh, saying where one's one is in regard to these companies, you have General Motors, you've got Ford, uh, you've got IBM, um, you've got Coca-Cola, you have uh, um, various of your banks, City Bank and, 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 and things of that kind. Why I wouldn't have wanted to name them is that I would be, I would be forced to name some and not others because I, I don't have a comprehensive list and, and that is why I, um, I was uh, reluctant to say which particular companies. There are, there are more, I think there are about 300 companies, in fact, uh, American companies. Uh, a after you return uh, home, is it possible that I could keep get in touch with you and get a, a comprehensive list? Yes. In fact, you will you'll be able to get one uh, from various groups in this country that are uh, um, concerned about the situation. I mean, Randall Robinson's Trans Africa in in Washington D.C. would be able to provide you with such a list. Uh, the the Washington the Washington office on Africa would be able to do that as well. But I mean, let, let's keep in touch. I I would be very glad to keep in touch with you. Yes. What does apartheid do to an individual? I think it can help to fill you with a lot of bitterness and anger and frustration, because you are treated as if you were not a human being. And I suppose that you in this country have had a little bit of that kind of experience in the, um, your Jim Crow days, especially in the South, where you were a non-person really, uh, a non-entity, um, when you could be called, I mean your father or grandfather was called boy, and your grandmother girl your human dignity um, went for a went for a loop um, and it's basically that uh, you are treated as if you are less than a human being if if I were to catch a plane today to go to uh, South Africa so what a township um, after having lived in America all my life in Detroit for a number of years what would be the immediate impact of apartheid on me after having stepped off the plane? Because you are black, you would have to have some means of uh, saying whether you have a right to be where you were. All black people from the age of 16, male or female, must carry a pass because they are not free to travel and move freely in the land of their birth. You have to live in a ghetto such as Soweto. You wouldn't be free to live wherever you wanted. Um, <coughs> you, you would not be free to go to any school or your children would not be free to go to any school. Um, you, I mean, you know, one of the most important is you are not really a citizen because you would not be allowed to vote and therefore the laws that apply against you would be inherently unjust because you didn't have um, a part in their making. Uh, Bishop Tutu, after you return home uh, back to your pulpit and you reflect on this trip to America, uh, the things that you wanted to say to America and how would you like to be remembered uh, by Americans? And when they think of uh, the Right Reverend uh, Desmond Tutu, what thoughts would you want to uh, come to mind? I would hope that they would remember that uh, our people are enormously 
grateful for what Americans are doing or have done, that our struggle is a just struggle and that Americans would be ready to be associated uh, with us, to be identified with us in our struggle, that uh, remembering their own history, especially black people in the civil rights movement, uh, they would be, they would want to be our allies um, and would, uh, I hope that they would remember that we came to this country primarily uh, to get Americans, wonderful people, uh, to pressure their government and the private sector to take action that will end apartheid. And I would suggest that they remember that that action is really just as simple as making the, state, the president of this country see South Africa as if it were Nicaragua. Uh, I started the interview off by saying a prophet always arrives on the scene. And I want to end it by saying that the prophet is now in Detroit. He is the right reverend. Desmond Tutu. It's a pleasure to have you talk to Power 96 and Electrifying Mojo. I will definitely keep in touch with you and I wish you the best. Thank you very, very much and God bless you all for 1986 and have a great time. Thank you very much.